happy that you brought it to my attention. Yeah. If I don't have that shit already, my brain goes yeah. and it's so, like dumping the water. So, so in the ocean is not cool for me. I saw Jaws at an at, at impressionable age. No, fun. Both my, dad, my dad took me to Jaws at my brother's opening night. Mm. No, it's, it's not, it's not helping. Yeah. Well, okay, so the, 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 the sharks Dike are actually in the hot water, and they're like three or four blo- um, beaches away. But the, no, it's not there. sharky. There. I'm, more, I'm more worried about... Uh, other things, but I had to go to a point where I used to have shark fear every time I started swimming. And you know what I used to do? I just used to make turn them all into like Nemo characters. Yeah. So if I get a fear, instead of me seeing I, like a shark face, I see like an animated shark. Yeah, that face. doesn't help. <laughs> 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 no, it doesn't no, work. No, it doesn't work. You won't go in the water with me. You wouldn't try it. Not, not that deep. Let me tell you what I'm more afraid of. Those yeah. religious women on religious day the other day, I saw a fully clothed woman in black tights. That was the biggest fear. That, okay. that, that is that scary. That doesn't scare me. No, that's scary to see a woman in black tights okay. in the middle of the sea in the deep part. Anyway, yalla. Hi. Hi, Alyssa. Wait, oh shoot, I forgot my, my thing. Hi, it's Alyssa. And it's Seth. And we're Short Hills, Hills live, live in, in the Middle, Middle East. Ah. <sighs> Wait, that, that was just an ah, no, ooh. No, nah, you know, I, 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 I'm good. I think the more I swim, it's better for my, you know, my whole psyche. Okay. I have something I really want to start with. Great. Because, as we know, like, there's always something miraculous happening in this country of Israel. True. And whether it be a breakthrough innovation in medicine, science, or the arts, there never ceases to be something new on the horizon here in Israel. Of course, even the sheer existence of the state of Israel is a true miracle. And today, which on the Hebrew calendar is the 28th of Ayar, is that how you say it? We Yar? Yeah. Yar. Yeah. Okay. We are dancing in the streets of Jerusalem, celebrating Yom Yarushalayim, Jerusalem Day. I know, I'm not a singer. Anyway, but I still, li- I still like to sing, right? So on this day in 1967, marking the end of the Six-Day War, Israeli soldiers freed the old city of Jerusalem from Jordanian rule. And finally, after 2,000 years, we were close to our Temple Mount. Emotional images of Jewish soldiers with their guns on one arm and wrapping themselves with tefillin or Jewish prayer on the other. The quintessential image of the Jew forever fighting to be a light upon the nations. This is a national holiday today with certain schools and businesses closed. The Hillel prayer, which Seth is going to explain, is recited in synagogues praising the Almighty. There are memorials remembering those who made the ultimate sacrifice in service to our nation. And as all things Israeli, there are celebrations throughout the streets of the holy city of Jerusalem, especially in the old city. What did you do in the synagogue today? So um, in the synagogue today, uh, we did not pray Hallel because uh, I go to a Chabad. Mm -hmm. I normally do pray Hallel and I would like to uh, do that, but Chabad is not uh, necessarily on board with that. Okay. I don't even care about that. I care about what is Hallel. Okay, Hallel is a Jewish prayer of thank you. It's not Hillel, it's Hallel. Hallel like hallelujah. Like hallelujah. Right. Okay, okay. We say that prayer as Jews to give a special thanks to God on the beginning of the month, Rosh Chodesh, mm-hmm. on a celebration such as Yom Yerushalayim Day. It's a special prayer of thanks mm-hmm. that Jews give to Hashem. Hashem means literally the name. Mm-hmm. There's a name for a God that we don't say unless we're saying it in prayer, so I won't say it. But when I refer to Hashem, we're saying so thank you that's to Hashem. A, that's, that's, that's a religious thing that that's you don't say thing. it. So I, I can say it, but because now you made me feel nervous, so it's like yud hey vav okay. okay, we won't get into the whole religious aspects right. of it. I saw, and I sent you a few of these videos. I got so emotional. You know, I am really detached from Yom Yerushalayim. I, I don't know why well, I have you're a my bad Tel Aviv feeling. girl, right. and I think that, you know, Yom Yerushalayim is really just a special day. I just want to take a moment. But I not mean, it's just all... for Jerusalemites. No, no. For, That's for... the problem, that there's sh- a big yeah, rift we can, in between. We can discuss that. Yeah. You know, I, being born in 1967... It was always a very, very special day to me that Jerusalem was united in June. You were talking about the Six Day War, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I know and I just to you know, not to get too complicated, but leading up to the Six Day War, 
what was going on here in Israel was a very, very, very shocking, uh, sad state of affairs. All these Arab armies, five Arab armies led by the Egyptian Nasser, were going to drive Israel into the sea. There were, at that time, in 1967, about two and a half million Jews living here. After the war, after the declaration of the State of Israel in 1948, right. they wanted a complete annihilation they of wanted the State a, of Israel, which was meaning right, all and, the Jews. And put in that video, we were very scared as a nation. Jews in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, all over the country, didn't think there were enough graves. They were digging graves. It was a huge miracle. We weren't really expected to win that war. And the fact that we won it in six days, fantastic miracle. But there was something very strange I saw. They added in that video. That video was full of information. We will post that video, of course, that they gave Moshe Dayan. No, who was it that they gave the honor to name the war, it really all occurred in six hours, it but was, he I, named it the Six-Day War I, because I, of something to do with the creation well, of the, the world right. in, in six So I believe days. it was, I believe it was Rabin who was the general who that named, was the, who who named gave, it. That named it? Yes. I don't but, remember. But let's, but let's just take a step back and understand what was going on in Israel at mm -hmm. the time. So Nasser, president of Egypt, said he was going to drive Israel into the sea. Mm -hmm. Israel, Levi Eshkol was our prime minister. And we told the Jordanians, now we're talking about Yerushalayim, please stay out of this war. Our beef is not with you. If you stay out of the war, Jerusalem will remain in its status quo. Oh. oh. Okay. I thought okay. you were going to repeat what you saw in the video. I'm like, don't do that. But oh, my God. Okay. okay. So Nasser, in the opening salvo of the war, the Israeli Air Force flew down at 7.15 in the morning on a Monday morning and destroyed the Egyptian Air Force on the ground. Right. Huge miracle. We, we controlled the sky. Right. Just like in the Torah, God hardened Nasser's heart. Right. And instead of being having hubris and saying, oh, I, I have a problem here, he boasted that we are not, that his air force was destroyed. We're about to destroy Israel. And right. he baited the little king, I call him the little king, Hussein uh -huh. of Jordan, to come into the war. He said, if you don't come into the war now, all the spoils will be over. Okay. So we were handed a victory by God. Not only did we destroy the Egyptian air force coming back, but our air force returned. And just as the Jordanians tried to start with us, Right. Our air force was intact and we completely destroyed them and okay. took the old city and reunited Jerusalem. It is a huge miracle. If you go into more videos and things like that, our special pilots who flew literally right on the water to avoid the radar of the Egyptians talked about when they looked left and right, they saw angels on their wings. They actually felt... Like a, it, presence. a presence that wow. they were being gu Special. guided by angels Special. down to do this mission. So it was really something I mean, special. Again, we're going to post this video. It is, I was overwhelmed today. And then I felt a little guilty because I'm sitting there in Tel Aviv and I've always been pretty much detached from Yerushalayim. And I think it's that horrible movie by David Broza that makes your stomach churn when you see what was going down on Jerusalem Day. But it, it makes sense. And I think that this should be part of the entire country. And it should be part of the conversation. If I could just add, before after 1948, when we were able to successfully, in the War of Independence, have a country, we lost the ability to control the old city of Jerusalem. The Jordanians, as you mentioned, controlled it. Not only did the Jordanians control it, but the Jordanian army threw out and destroyed all the synagogues in the Jewish quarter, and the Jews were forcibly evacuated from the old city, thrown out. For how long? 19 years. We were not allowed to go to our holy sites. We couldn't go to the Western Wall. We couldn't... But I thought it was in 2000... We hadn't been back there in 2,000 years by the time the Six-Day War started. Okay, That's not true. So or, Jews always lived in the old city. Right. But in let's go a little bit in history. Okay. 1948, okay. three years after the Holocaust, the okay. Shoah, mm -hmm. we were able to declare a state because Ben-Gurion bravely said, we have an opportunity here, and he's declared the state, and... All these Arab armies attacked us, and we prevailed. Okay, we, we, that was one war. That was one war. That was the War of Independence. Independence War. In the War of Independence, though, if you're in Jerusalem, the border of Jerusalem for Western Jerusalem was the King David or, or David Street, the King David Hotel. Okay. The, the Mamila okay. uh, Mall, right. up to the, the ramparts of the old city, right. that was a no-man's land. 
Okay. And the and the Jordanian army sat on the walls of the old city. Okay, so they now I understand it. that thing when they were bringing the food in and out from Correct. the Mount Zion Hotel. Correct. Okay. See, we all have little parts of stories okay. that okay. we know. So now we were denied going to our holiest places. Which is the Temple Mount. Well, the holiest of the holy is the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount. Okay. But once a year on Tisha B'Av, mm-hmm. which is the commemorates the destruction of the first and second. Right. It's a super sad day. Super and sad day. Fast. It's it's intense. Okay. On those Seth fasts, on, I don't. On that day, for two thousand years, the Christian world and the Muslim world allowed us to that was the only day we were allowed to go to the Kotel. And that's why the Kotel, which we know as the wall, Kotel literally means wall. We're teaching Western our wall. Western right, Wall. Right, right. But it's been known in history as the Wailing Wall. Wailing You've heard wall. that. Right. Well, why was it the Wailing Wall? Because that was the day Tisha B'Av, the Jews cried for the oh, destruction. Oh, my God. I love you, my fax guy, Seth. Okay. Okay. All right. Makes sense. S- okay. So now we're in 1967. Okay. And what, years. what is it that we're allowed to do? Only one day a year we're allowed to go to the to the Kotel. Throughout history, well, that was the only day that the that our well, persecutors. Well, I have to say this in Hebrew. Ani lo mamina. Okay. Bemed. Wow. That was the That's only day. Yofi. That was the only day we were allowed uh, to have worship at the this wailing wall. Okay. We were sitting in ashes and sackcloth and commemorating the day of destruction. Our enemies were watching us cry and laughing at us. That's okay. that's the history. Now, how far were they able to go? They were able to go to the Temple Mount? No, never to go to the Temple okay. Mount. Okay. So just, I think we've spoken about it from the very beginning. And I, we did because we we're going to talk about a picture. But when you think of Jerusalem, everybody thinks of a gold dome. So that is a gold dome. And that is not anything to do with the Jewish religion But what is underneath and under the ground, which shows the history of the Jewish people, is where the holiest of the holy site is, which is very deep down. That foundation stone. We call it the Temple Mount. It's a foundation stone. No, but it's highlighted because of the gold. But it's because the the Muslims came in and they covered the holy site of the Jewish people. It's very... Simple. It's simple, but it, it it doesn't start with the Arabs building or the Muslims or Islam building that gold. Oh, was dome. it Herod or somebody did? So, so okay. what happened? The second temple, which was destroyed by the Romans in the year seventy A.D. by Titus. I think we might not get so deep into. Okay, it. but I'm just okay. saying it was it was it was basically destroyed in the year zero mm-hmm. seventy A.D. Okay, and it sat as a destruction for seven hundred years until the Arab conquest when when Islam conquered and then they came. But why and, did they put it there? Because that's where the temple stood. So you put because it because right, why? Because, because Abraham or Abraham sacrificed. Because Abraham sacrificed Isaac there. And it was so well in the known. Quran, yeah, so it whoever, says that. It says that. But what does it say? In the Quran? Yeah. It says everything that the Torah says, and it, in fact it says that... But instead of calling Abraham, they called him Ibrahim. Yeah. Was he a Muslim or was he a Jew? No, he wasn't. He went, We talked about that on the timeline. Yes. On the timeline, we understand that Avram, who is our forefather, is also the forefather of all monotheisms. He's mm-hmm. the forefather of Christianity and Islam. Okay. Okay, but we're getting a little bit into yeah, the we weeds. Are. We're okay, so what, what I just want to say is that that gold dome, which is iconic and shows what people think of when they look at Jerusalem, that iconic dome, that is where the first temple that was built by King Solomon stood, and that is also where the second temple of King Herod stood. Okay, let's go back to Yom Yerushalayim Day. And why it's so significant. I was just curious. The Temple Mount was never a place where Jews were allowed to go. Uh, and I think uh, the world truly doesn't understand the concept of the Temple Mount, that even after the Six-Day War, and we felt, my God, we're here, we're Jews, we're at the Western Wall, we're great. The bottom line is we still have never gotten to the Holies of the Holies, which is very apropos because today, on Yom Yerushalayim Day, there are riots there. Do you know correct. about yes, that? Yes, I do, I do. Unbelievable. Okay, Unbelievable. so I just want to correct one thing. We did go there when... Jerusalem was the capital under the Davidic dynasty and Solomon and King Herod before there was Christianity. Right. Jewish, the the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies once a year on Yom Kippur. Right. That's back then. For 2,000 years since we were thrown out. Right. We weren't allowed to go there. What's significant about Yom Yerushalayim Day is after a war of independence, 19 years later, we weren't allowed to go 
and we told our enemies we're not have any interest in Jerusalem. They attacked us, and then they came in, and we were forced to conquer the city. To take it. But and now he- we've made the holy sites the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is where Jesus was oh, sacrificed. we freed that for the Christians? We freed that for the Christians. Not only Armenian? did we... Did we do anything for the Armenians? The Armenian quarter is free for worship. Religious freedom, because of the Jewish reunification of Jerusalem, is free for everybody. But what I'm trying to say is, you were alluding to one thing, which is, on that day when we, which is today, when we united Jerusalem, the famous general Mordechai Gur went in through the lion's gate, and he said famously, Harabait Yad Ardenu, which means... Literally, the Temple Mount is in our hands. Ah, okay. We captured the Temple Mount. Well, that's interesting because they really didn't. Well, we did capture it, and the Arabs who were part of the old city who were telling us leading up to the Six-Day War that they were going to throw us into the sea and massacre two and a half million mm-hmm. and finish the job that Hitler did not do, right? they ran to Jordan. Moshe Dayan, who was the general presiding over that, went and brought them back. And he handed over the keys to the Temple Mount, which were in our hands after the war, to the Waqf, which is the religious authority of wow. Islam. So we had the ability. It was a huge mistake, in so my Moshe opinion. So Moshe Dayan gave the key to the Waq. Waqf. Waqf. W-A-Q-F. Not the Waq. No, Waqf. Waqf. It's like a waffle and a Waq is a Waq. So we won the war. Okay. And in... in in trying to not change the status quo and offend anybody, mm. we said uh, there was fear after because what they would have done to us after the war that we would have destroyed the Golden Dome and put the third temple up there and things like that. What we were trying to, to do say in the is be- like we're not going to do anything. We're radical. not going to do anything okay. wild. Oh, that's, but, okay. that's very human of Israelis. It wow, was how interesting. And today, <laughs> as Why you were isn't alluding, that to, highlighted in the world. And today, as you were alluding to, instead of Jews being able to go up there and worship as we allow Islam and and Christians and everybody to, the Temple Mount is the throne of Hashem or God on this earth. Mm -hmm. So it should be, if we're really being fair, free for worship for every nationality and every religion. So as I, as I know, okay, first of all, I've never been up there. And as a, as an artist and as a designer, I find it's such a shame because it's a beautiful place. I will take you up there. Okay. I'm I'm a little terrified. Now here's why I'm a little you terrified. Be terrified. No, I'm a little terrified. First of all, Jews are never supposed to go up. I mean, I learned this when I studied Jewish education yeah. in the old city, and we were not allowed to go up there. First of all, because as a Jew, we might step on the wrong place and we might step on something holy that we shouldn't. That was number one. Number two, I guess there's this status quo. And that was that the Arabs have control of that area because it is their mosque. It's not their biggest mosque. Their biggest mosque is in Mecca. And actually, their most important mosque in Jerusalem, do you know it's the black one? It's yes. not even the gold one. And that one is called Al-Aqsa, which is which referred is to in the Quran. Th- and as Al-Aqsa literally means in the Quran, the furthest mosque. Jerusalem is never mentioned in the Quran. But everybody associate- always thinks al is yeah, the yeah. gold one. That's what's so fascinating. No, no, uh, the, the black one is... A lot of people is, do. Okay. Because they always use... al Aska. al Aska. That sounds like Alaska. Okay. Oh, my gosh, what's with me today? But the reality of it is, is that a Jew is allowed to visit, but they are not allowed to pray. And for a Jew to pray, they have to use their mouths. So if a Jew goes up there and he moves his mouth, he is taken away by... Would it be Israeli police? Would it be a Palestinian Authority police? It's the Waqf police and supervised by the Israeli army. The demographics and the circumstances on the Temple Mount are changing. I go and pray with a young man in my synagogue who goes up and prays every morning with a group on the Temple Mount. And with he's the ele- redheaded, the, the, the guy that became the MK? That guy Glick. and some others. I haven't. Glick. Yeah, He's so, so I, radical. Okay, so anyway, Jews should be able to to pray up there, just like every other nationality. But, but what happens is they get a lot of people, a lot of Arabs up there. Like the women go up and la, 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 they start screaming at people. It's I think you'll find this videos. interesting. Before the Six Day War in Yom Yerushalayim, the Israeli government was afraid to have people pray at the Kotel because the the plaza that we look at today Contention. that's empty. Yes. 
That is called the Mukhrabi neighborhood. There was an Arab neighborhood that went right up to the wall. The Western Wall for 2,000 years was literally a little alley. And right up to the alley was a neighborhood. Now, when we won the Six-Day War, in, when wars are won, we you took- can change the circumstances on the ground. We removed that neighborhood to create a plaza that you witness today so that thousands upon thousands of Jews could have a place Wait, to I'm going to be a liberal Israeli can and I- ask you what happened to the people in the neighborhood. No, they were, they were removed. They went to Jordan? No, no, no. They, they're, they're, they could go to uh, the Arab Quarter or other places, but they... That, okay. Okay. Right. My point was, we are now afraid to go up to the Temple Mount and move our lips and things like that because it might offend people on the Temple Mount. Not offend. Pro- it's, it's just... Before the Six-Day War... at this point, before as I know the, it. Before the Six-Day War, we were afraid to go to the Western Wall to do it because we might offend the people there. The point is we're overly sensitive. I we were t- we we told Jordan the King Hussein. I'm going to reiterate this point. Don't enter the war. He had hubris and came into the war and lost in a big, big way. I just love that you're using the word hubris. It's like an SAT word. Yeah. Okay. I want to bring up this subject in a different way because why are we not celebrating Yom Yerushalayim as an entire country? That's a great question. Why is it just sort of put to the religious? And it was interesting because I I did put the question across because I know Chabad doesn't always celebrate all the holidays. And I asked them, does Yom Yerushalayim Day count as something that you would celebrate? Well, I I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast that that they don't do Hallel because Chabad is not necessarily Zionistic. Right. Chabad is a Jewish organization, but they don't... Light upon the world. I love Chabad. I go to a Chabad. I do too. But the but, Rebbe never came to But Israel. there are certain things. I don't really want to get into that because I really feel that there should be a Chabad representative that explains it because sure. they know how to dance that dance quite okay. well. But uh, let's get back to the point of that. You know, this is really, I think, Tachlis... What eats at me here and what makes it so difficult for me to think of myself as, quote, unquote, an Israeli and to be living in Israel, because I I find that the native doesn't necessarily respect their country nor their fellow Israelis. Now, something like Jerusalem Day, I mean, this is part of our history. Why is it not celebrated countrywide? Why is it not a complete national holiday? Well, it is celebrated countrywide, but it's celebrated amongst the religious, as you might say. It's not secular. But why? And, 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 why? Because I'm it's just the explaining. Kotel? Because it's the wall? Isn't that what every, even I see secular Jews go with their kids for their bar mitzvah, and they go where? I'm with you 100%. I think it's a lost opportunity People in Tel Aviv who are disassociated with Jerusalem or think that Jerusalem is the religious city and Tel Aviv is a secular city or that most Israelis, people should understand in Short Hills Live, it's a secular place. I mean, we have Arab judges. What is a secular place? Jerusalem itself or the whole country country, of Israel? The whole country of Israel. Of course. Okay. And therefore, this religiousness scares people. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's where it's coming from, that they don't want to acknowledge that the reason that we're here, and the only reason we're here, this is coming from Seth Kogan, is that a big miracle happened. Not only would the people of Jerusalem have lost their lives uh, in the War of Independence or the Six-Day War, but Tel Aviv would have been also pushed into the sea. It's conveniently forgotten. There were pogroms in Jaffa and 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 whatnot. I get we it. have I a just big don't miracle. Understand that the only why reason that we're this he- contention, and I think that we hear about in the news all the time the problems between the Jews and the Arabs. But you know, the Jews amongst themselves within the country of Israel, it is a very difficult situation. I don't think we have time because we went so deeply into the history of Jerusalem Day and okay. the Six Day War and, and all the history of the Temple Mount, but. It is something that hurts me deeply. It should. I think that. I think that. And I'm not religious, our, which our is problems, I mean, I have a background, our problems but I'm not emanate religious. from ourselves, and that exactly. really is discussed in the Torah. That our enemies are here to remind us that we're not doing the right things as brethren between ourselves. If we were united, and you're making an excellent point, the Arabs, the Christians, the nations 
would have nothing to say because we would stand proudly united. The fact that Jew can say this or that against each other gives our enemies cover to basically not only attack us politically or verbally or, God forbid, the war. If we were united as one people, and I don't really believe there's religious or not religious, it's a question of the way the Jewish nation was founded and based in the Bible or the Torah is that we have certain responsibilities that we're supposed to do. Whether we're doing them or not doing them, we're all supposed to be doing them. Well, it's really interesting because many years ago, I remember always hearing people go, well, don't worry about the Arabs because they'll they're just going to kill each other because the factions are between Sunni and Shiite. They'll go back and forth. I mean, we're no different. And let's even take it another level. We are going back into elections for a prime minister again. And it's so interesting to me. Everyone's like, well, don't mix religion and politics. But that's what this is. This is a country mixed of religion and politics. Correct. And I find it so frustrating when people say, well, we don't want this guy because he's too religious and he's going to do this to the country. And then this one is going to give away the country. There's so much frustration that right now now, literally, we're having to do a new election. This is the first time in Bibi, our history. Yeah, BB was not able to get his 61 people in his party. And what's the really interesting topic, and it goes right back to where we started, is because we have an MK named Avigdor Lieberman, and he said, listen, I absolutely will not join your party if you don't make ultra-Orthodox Jews do the army. And I think he had a great point pulling us back again because, yes, we have the Kotel. Yes, Yom Yerushalayim is so important. But at the same time, like, those were soldiers at the Kotel. How can we not – how do we separate between religions? I'm I'm going to give a plug for Israel because, as they often say, making sausage is ugly when you go back and look at the making of the process. Mm -hmm. It's not nice and neat. It looks ugly. But that's what really makes a democracy vibrant. The fact that they couldn't get together and make a government, that is sad. But that's the way democracy works sometimes, and they'll have to go back and yeah, uh, try to do it again. Yeah, of course. I mean, it, if you fact, look, if you, if you plus if you the lo- fact is that one second. Plus the fact is, I think it's too much for someone to be in office for how many years? It would be his fourth. His fourth term that he won. No, no, that's and crazy. So in a way, if you look at the, it's if you, nice if, that he. If you look at the Palestinian, th- if you look at the Palestinian created. Authority, Abbas, who they're well, saying that's a is dictatorship. That, oh, well, it's not supposed to be. He's supposed to hold elections. He hasn't held elections since Who, 2007. Abbas? Yeah. No, but man, come on. It's a- so what I'm saying is that democracy, whether it's in the United States or in Israel, is messy at times because people don't always disagree and the disagreements are very public and we get to see them. And the way a democracy and a parliamentary government works is BB won and was allowed to put together a government, but he couldn't form the coalition. So it'll happen again. But, but so you know, the many, country will move on. They're talking about many reasons, but the main one was this Lieberman's – and I – He was I the one that tore like, down the government to begin with because he was defending the people of the South. He said they're not being represented – and he was the one that left the government. Remember, uh-huh. we talked about this in one of the earlier podcasts. He was the minister of defense. I always feel like he's that guy that says everything that makes everyone go, mm, and they, like, hold themselves. But he's really that person that that says what we all want to say but just can't really always do it. And he's always, like, the bad guy. Now, here's my perspective on the ultra-Orthodox doing the army. And I don't know if you've ever explained it before. I think we did a little bit in the beginning. So our ultra-Orthodox boys and girls don't do the army. They don't pay taxes either, as I recall. Well, they, and this they, is a really... That's not necessarily true. They okay, so tax. this is a difficult point in, with all Israelis. It makes us very, very uncomfortable. And it's not true that all orth, uh, ultra-Orthodox don't serve in the army. They're given the ability not to. Uh, but they're, as, they don't have to serve as they don't have every to. native Israeli kid that is born here needs to do service. And not or, every native Israeli kid at this moment serves either. I live in a time not when the country was founded where everybody needed to serve. 
there are not enough jobs for people that want to serve. So I think it's it becomes a bit more complicated in the sense that... It is, that but let's not make excuses. Bottom line is that every kid needs to do service in the Army at some level, okay? But not an ultra-Orthodox kid. I could see where there's going to be a problem there's with tension that. There's yeah. And wouldn't... If there was something, we talked about it a little bit, if only there was some sort of program so that we could unite, so that a secular kid could meet an ultra-Orthodox kid and say, okay, the only thing that's common between us is that we are Jews, but otherwise we might be totally different. But perhaps in just this meeting, we can find some common denominator and we would have less tension between all these sides. And the army used to be, and that's one of the nice things about the army, as a big melting pot that everybody, whether they were rich, poor, they were Yemenite, Ashkenaz, Fard, they all right, mixed and had, yeah. to, and had to serve in the army. Mm-hmm. So I like that aspect of it, but it's another thing that we're going to have to deal with going forward because there really isn't in a modern army enough jobs for all the people that want to serve. So it's a morale thing. If someone doesn't want to serve, having had Two yeah, children I in the army. We would, you don't want push, someone right. serving next to them who's conflicted about serving. Okay. At the same time, when an ultra orthodox soldier comes back from service and he goes into Bnei Brak or he goes into Meashiri, he should not be attacked by the masses, I agree. which has happened many times, which is completely disgraceful, completely disgusting. And I have no problem putting every one of those attackers, you know, and arresting right. every one uh, of those. They uh, all should be in jail. It's, uh, it's ridiculous behavior. And that is this utter disgustingness of Jew against Jew, of pitting Jew I against Jew. I agree with you. I think as the country moves forward that in order to succeed that the financially, the Orthodox will become less primitive. No, but Matt. no, in order to succeed financially in this country, We're called the startup nation. High-tech jobs actually seek people who have skills that they've learned in the army. Mm -hmm. In order for the ultra-Orthodox to succeed in a 21st century economy, they're going to have to go to the army and and learn these skills. They're, They're only hurting themselves. So I think all of this, in a way, will sort of get worked out. But the... Going from point A to point B can be messy, but and, that's and what we're dealing with. And on the flip side, they are – when the ultra-Orthodox are soldiers and they do serve, I've heard miraculous. They're unbelievable oh. because they're so well taught well, the, and they know how to be focused and And they're Zionistic. They're Some of, when yeah. the country was founded, the most zealous, terrific fighters were kibbutzniks. Mm-hmm. Because they actually believed in you know what they were doing in the land. Now, it might not be ultra-Orthodox, but – Kids like my child who are Dati Lumi or Modern Orthodox. Modern Orthodox. Yes. They're very committed soldiers. So we, we have religious Orthodox boys and young women doing very important things. We, we might want to separate or, or have a better understanding of, you know, who yeah, because is I'm, not. I'm listening to this and I'm thinking to myself, wow, I've been there when soldiers were going into the battlefield and they always look back to that kid with the kippah. For and some reason, tefillin, yeah, yeah, the tefillin. We'll talk about tefillin. Maybe Seth will do a little instructional well, video of what is tefillin the, yeah. and why do Jewish men wear little black houses on their foreheads. Yes. We could probably talk about this a lot. I told you I have many opinions, and I also feel that ultra-Orthodox, there should be some sort of testing. And I believe that it is very important to a Jewish country to have religious people praying and to keep the Torah laws and to understand that they should be completely immersed in academia. I totally believe this. And I just a, I think that there's some of them that are using it as an excuse and there they, are. they and put a make, bad name for the rest of them. You're making an important point here. In Judaism, the way we understand is that the world exists because of Torah scholars. Now, making a very important point. You can't have a successful army if you when Sadat uh, what was when uh, Stom and Gomorrah were destroyed, it was because there was no righteous people in the world. Mm-hmm. When people are studying God's book, mm-hmm. Torah, mm-hmm. that's righteousness, and mm-hmm. the world can't be destroyed. So, in other words, if you have ten or more people, or people who are opting out of the army to study Torah, 
they're adding to the army. I mean, it's a hard it's a hard okay. thing to understand, but they need to be doing it in a committed way and not just saying, I'm going to get out of the army and do this and not really. Right. So I'm saying it's an important thing that they're actually contributing. I, I completely agree. I couldn't agree more. I think it is very important during difficult times, people pray and you feel the power of prayer. So I completely agree that we should have Torah scholars all the time. I mean, that should be Israel. It, it should be well. There is a, there's a, there there are places online that that you can go and see that people are studying Torah twenty four seven around the clock because literally a Jewish concept is if Torah was not to be studied even for one second the world would end like spin off of its axis. This is a Jewish concept. Whoa! So that's a perfect way to take us right into the next holiday, which is why is cheese on sale in supermarkets in Israel right now? Okay. So answer my question. It's a it's a riddle. Because uh, Shavuos, which is the holiday, Shavuot, Shavuot, which Shavuos. we are, which is we talked about, is forty nine days from when we left Egypt to when we're uh, getting the Torah at the Sinai event, is a dairy holiday. Why is it a dairy holiday? Is very interesting. I'll just touch on this in a point. Before we were getting the Torah, everybody in the was preparing meat. But we didn't have the laws of kashrut. Kashrut was being given in the Torah at the same time. And everything that was prepared was treif, was not acceptable to eat. So it had to be thrown out. Mm -hmm. And that's why a Shavuot, which we're going to celebrate next Saturday, is known as the dairy holiday. That answers why. Plus the fact is that we study all night long. So that brings us full circle. We have a little prop here. We have the show. Oh, wait show a minute. Mark. Oh, we got a little uh, bit got, of, yeah, we, we got, got a little show. So, so I, gonna, it's not Rosh Hashanah, but for some reason, this showed up in the studio. So on Place Yom Yerushalayim. Oh, yeah, okay. When there's the iconic picture, and I think Alyssa is going to Put find it. The it. three soldiers. The three soldiers oh, and Rabbi heart. Shlomo Goren blowing the chauffeur for the first time in 2,000 years at the Kotel. Here so, we go. Here we go. One, two, three. It sounds like something else. Sounds True like something else. Yeah, Vicky Agadola. Yeah, stand up. Give, yeah, give it. Here we go. It's not, let's One, just know two, that three. the chauffeur's not easy. All right, let me give you a visual. Seth is bright red. He's lacking oxygen. All right. Sounds like All a right. bad car. Bad, bad, Woo. bad. All right. All right. Well, well, this was, um, a, you want to try more? I think we're going to end it on that note. So uh, have a happy Yom Yerushalayim. Here we go. All right. (laughs) That's a fail. Yeah, that that did not go over well. Yeah. All right. Oh, well, um, shalom, shalom. Shalom Shalom can can be be high high and and shalom shalom can can be be by. Lots of light. (laughs) <laughs> okay, breathe. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. You're going to die. Hold on. Okay, hold on. put 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 like um <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Uh, True.